Hello everybody, today you once again find me with a Kia Stinger, and this is not the first time I've had a new Stinger on the channel, but it is to be the last, and I wanted to give this a fitting send-off, because as far as I'm concerned, this is one of the most underrated cars of the past decade. But more than that, the Stinger also means an awful lot to me personally. Over the last month, I have been trying to think of a fitting epithet for the Stinger, and I had two competing ideas. One, a fairly straight review where I tried to explain why I believe this really is a Korean Maserati. The other, a slightly more lyrical, philosophical piece talking about how the history of this car and my YouTube channel seem to be almost permanently intertwined. I couldn't decide which one I wanted to do, so today I'm cheating and I'm giving you both smashed together in something that I hope is going to be a little bit more interesting than doing one or the other. So today, the story of the Stinger and me. Enjoy. <laughs> The Stinger is a fantastic car for a great number of reasons, many of which we will be discussing today. But I think it's also the one that best exemplifies Kia's meteoric rise, particularly here in Britain. 15 years ago, had you told someone you bought a Kia, you would have been laughed out of the room. They were viewed alongside things like Daewoo and Proton, and I expect many people thought they might have gone the same way. But instead, they've gone on to become one of Britain's best-selling brands. 2023 marks the final year of production for the Stinger. It is now officially discontinued with no direct successor. However, if there is any sense of justice in history, I hope that in a few years this car will be viewed as the landmark that it is. A car that did for Kia the same as things like the Quattro did for Audi. My story, as it relates to today, began in 2016 when I decided to become a YouTuber. Previously, I had a career in film and television where I was a director of photography, chiefly on many a low-budget, short, music video and feature film, which, if I'm lucky, you probably won't have seen. I thought the best way to start was to make an impression and to do things a little bit differently. So I bought a Lotus Evora 400, not just a fantastic driver's car and one which I thoroughly enjoyed, but also something that I thought would help me stand out. It turns out that I may have over-anticipated the internet's demand for Lotus content, certainly at that time, and so the first few years proceeded slowly. Regardless, I chose to carry on, creating as much Lotus content as I could. I also made a lot of great friends, and to this day, the Lotus community is one that I have a particular affinity for. It is filled with some amazing people. However, I always knew that Lotus content alone was not going to be enough to sustain an entire channel, and so I was always looking for other opportunities with different brands. But being a small YouTuber myself, it was very difficult to forge these relationships. There were many emails and many rejections, but none of them addressed to Kia. Then, in 2017, the stinger landed, and my ears pricked up, because I looked at that and thought, ooh, now that does look like a really cool car. That is exciting. And I figured if I've got a chance with anyone, it could be with them. So, in late 2017, I sent them an email saying, Hello, I'm James. I'm a YouTuber. I'd love to work with you. And I heard nothing back for about two weeks. And then I got a reply. It was an invitation to join them on what they called their Drive It Day. This is something that many manufacturers run. In short, they hire a nice venue, bring a whole bunch of cars along, then you turn up and go, yeah, I'll have a go in that one. You go out for an hour, I'll have a go in that one. You go out for an hour, so on and so forth. I was joined by my good friend Laurie, who at that time was still very heavily involved in the channel. If you're not sure who I'm talking about, he's now better known as the face of Laurie's Mechanical Marvels. I was a nothing YouTuber back then, the channel had just a few thousand subscribers, and it felt as if I was being treated like royalty, being put up at this gorgeous hotel, fed this amazing food, which it turns out is a hallmark of Kia PR events, and then of course given the keys to all of these different cars. And it turns out, though I didn't realise at the time, Kia were taking something of a risk, because I later found out I was actually the first YouTuber that Kia UK worked directly with. I didn't really even think of that at the time, but today I consider that a real honour. They could have chosen pretty much anyone they wanted, but they went with me. 
and that means a lot. Now, of course, this being one of my very first press events, I was keen to make a good impression, and I didn't want it to be too obvious that most of the stuff they had I was not at all interested in, like the Sorrento 4x4, the Picanto, the small city car that they have. There was really only one car there that excited me, the Stinger. And at this particular event, they were launching the two-litre four-cylinder variant, but that also wasn't a car that really interested me. I wanted to drive the full-fat 3.3-litre, 370-horsepower one, and happily, they had one of those. I took it out and was absolutely blown away. This was a fantastic car. I loved every moment in it. I have some genuinely fond memories of that day. Not only was it brilliant just to be out playing cars with my good buddy Laurie, but also to be treated seriously by another mainstream manufacturer meant a lot. Previously, I had been on a press event with Toyota and then did a second one after, but not much following that. And I was really genuinely worried that that was a one-off thing that they offered me and afterwards they thought, you know what? Pfft, he's not worth working with again. That turned out not to be the case. I've done a lot with Toyota since, but to have a second manufacturer offer to do stuff with me, that was pretty cool. The only other one that I was working with at the time was Caterham. And though I really did enjoy that, Caterham are not exactly a global powerhouse. Kia were becoming increasingly so. It is very easy to remember exactly when this all was too, because it was the week of the beast from the east, if you remember that. The snowstorms we had here in Britain, some of the worst on modern record. And of course, we'd all been told that this was going to be coming, but us being British, we all said, yeah, 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 snow's coming, snow's coming, we're all going to be trapped inside, Pff, yeah, never going to happen, is it? until about three o'clock in the afternoon on the day that I was there and the snow did begin to fall. So I was outside in what felt like something of a blizzard trying to act professional and talk about this car with Laurie and um, that was quite amusing. I really, really do remember that very fondly. I was also absolutely taken aback when at the end of the event, Kia said to me, if you'd like to have a press car out of us, um, we can probably arrange that too. And that was a big deal. However, as you might imagine, being the new kid does come with a few restrictions. Manufacturers simply aren't going to start throwing you cars every single week. You have to earn them. So, to try and work out what exactly it was that I wanted to have from the press fleet, Kia invited me to come down to the press garage and spend a day driving a couple of different cars. That week, I had actually organised a Caterham. And I thought it would be a great idea to drive said Caterham the 400 mile round trip from mine to the Kia press office, which is over in the west of Britain. I turned up, probably looking heavily sunburned, with some headphones on in this Caterham, and all the people at the Kia press office just stood there looking at me going, he's mad. This day was also quite memorable, not just for that, but it was also the first time ever that I got to drive an EV, just five years ago, but even then they were a real rarity, and I took out the first generation Kia Soul EV, and I actually quite enjoyed it. I went and saw a friend for lunch in it, and I really, really enjoyed that car and thought, you know, I'm going to explore this EV thing a little bit more. And as you can probably tell, those early meetings with Kia were quite fruitful. It is a relationship that I cherish to this very day, and I am eternally grateful to them for taking a chance on me, much like the company did by taking a chance in building this. I didn't really care what the badge was on the front of this. The Stinger is an incredible car. You have a 3.3 litre twin turbo V6 producing 370 horsepower and 370 pound foot of torque. That's 500 newton meters. That's connected to an eight speed automatic gearbox that's not a ZF. I erroneously said so in one of my first videos. Actually, it's of Kia's own making. And other than the fact that in early cars in particular, it didn't like staying in manual mode. It's fantastic, very responsive, as is the engine. And this thing, if nothing else, will really impress just about anybody that thought Kias were boring. Because this car's quick, really quick. The mid-range in particular, this car is savage. I haven't bothered to rig up an exhaust cam today because, like many a car, this later model is somewhat neutered, so it doesn't make much noise at all from outside. But 
If you do pop it into manual mode, twist the drive select down here, which offers you a bevy of modes, smart, eco, comfort, and then sport and sport plus, and you put it into sport, you'll note that the bolsters in the seat automatically hug you, which brings back memories of the old V10 M5, and this car will absolutely fly down the road. Let me give you a brief demonstration. So I'm in uh, fourth gear now, and I'm in a 60 limit. I'm going to slow down to about 40 mile an hour. OK, everything's clear around us. We'll let the traffic ahead clear. And uh, we're at just over 2,000 RPM, and foot down, and there's the power, and we're at 50, and we're at 60. This car moves. This car really, really moves. Up to about 60 mile an hour, it is savagely quick. If I were to criticise it for anything, it's desperately undertired. It has only two 5.5 sections on the back, and um, that's not enough. But before you've even got to the performance aspect of the car, what really impressed me about the Stinger is the level of equipment, fit and finish. This car is spectacularly appointed. Even the other day I was filming with Anthony doing some of the shots you'll see through this video, and I opened the door and he looked in and went, that's a Kia. He was blown away, as I think everybody would be. You've got leather, you've got aluminium, you've got a fairly traditional by modern standards dash here, but with a heads-up display, you've got, for later models, a much larger infotainment system with Android Auto, Apple CarPlay, heated and ventilated seats in the front, heated seats in the rear, you've got a powered smart tailgate, you've got double glazing, a sunroof, a Harman Kardon stereo that's actually pretty decent, you've got all the ADAS systems that you could ask for. This is a well-equipped car. For not a lot of cash, these top-of-the-line new cost you around £40,000, for which, if you were going with a traditional German manufacturer, you'd really get anywhere near that much kit. So, it's 2018, a few months after my first experience with the Stinger. I'm sat waiting to go into the cinema, and I get an email. It's from a chap called Kyler. He lives over in the United States, more specifically New York. And he says to me, James, you won't have heard of me, but I've been watching your channel and really quite enjoyed it. I also have a Lotus Evora 400, like I did at the time, and I run a small track day company here, running events chiefly out of a place called New York Safety Track, which you've likely never heard of. I hadn't. If you ever make it over to the USA, we have a number of events through the year and you would be my honoured guest. Come over here, we'll put you up somewhere, we'll feed you and you can go out on track in my car. Wow, what an offer, so kind. Only problem is, at that point, YouTube was still earning me the square root of zilch. So I thought that's a lovely, lovely thing. I'd love to do a track day, but New York is quite a way to go. Then, half an hour later, I get another email, and it says, Hello James, my name's John. You won't have heard of me, but I love your channel, been watching it for a little while. I'm heavily involved in Porsche circles over in the USA, but I'm also a Lotus fan and have an XC Series 2, which in the States is an incredibly rare thing. I'm responsible for organising some of the track days here for the Porsche Club of America, and we have an event at Watkins Glen later in the year. If you'd like to come and join me, you'd be my honoured guest. I'll put you up, I'll feed you, and you can drive my Lotus on track. Hang on a minute. I can drive a Lotus around Watkins Glen, even as a European. That is a legendary venue. That is hallowed ground. And I thought, right, I've now got two offers from two people to go to the USA, New York specifically, and drive a car round a track. If I can make this happen, I've got to make this happen. So, I hatched a plan. I went on the calendar for Kyler's company, Got Track Motorsport, and wanted to see if he had an event that was being run around the same time as that at Watkins Glen, which was a big three-day affair. And they did. They had an event on the Friday, and Watkins Glen was on the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The two also weren't all that far apart. 100 or 200 miles, but in America, that's nothing. So I thought, okay, that's August, that's my birthday, I'm getting out there. As I was still very heavily involved in Lotus, and the channel really was quite Lotus-centric, I put a post on the American Lotus forums and said, guys, I want to come over to the States. I think my starting point is going to be New York. Does anyone have a sofa or a spare room that I can borrow? Anything that I should see? Anywhere that I should go? 
and people responded in force. And very quickly, my plan got a little bit more complicated as people said, well, you should really come and visit here. And if you're going there, you need to go here. Well, if you're going there, you should probably do the tail of the dragon. And all of a sudden, my sort of one week away turned into a big three week, three and a half thousand mile road trip, going as far west as Nashville, Tennessee, where I was very, very kindly hosted by a lovely couple called Lou and Lindy, as far north as Buffalo, where I was hosted by a lovely chap called Joe, as far, well, I don't know which direction it's in, but to Pennsylvania, where a chap called Alan also sorted me out and was an absolute superstar. I got to go over to Gettysburg, which as a Brit is something I've heard of, but never really understood. And I do love my military history, so that was sensational. However, there was a bit of an issue. I was trying to do all of this on a real tight budget. And I'd worked out that I more or less didn't have to pay a penny for accommodation, thanks to the incredible generosity of the people that had been following me. But when it came to transport, I couldn't see an easy way out of that one. And a hire car for three weeks from New York is very expensive. So I thought, let's see how far I can push my luck. I'll get in touch with the only manufacturer that I know who also has a fleet over in the USA, which is Kia, and I asked their UK PR guy, Dan, who still works there and is an absolute legend, do you have a counterpart in the USA? Could I possibly pester them to see if there's even the remotest possibility of getting a hire car for about three weeks? And it can be literally anything. And he said, well, I'll get in touch with the guys over there. I'll ask the question, we'll see. Truthfully, I expected nothing. This was still a time when the channel was very small, views were limited, and the potential really for Kia to gain was pretty much nothing. About a week later, an email came through from Kia USA saying, okay, who are you? What do you want? How long do you want it for? And where do you want it from? I said, well, here's who I am. Here's my very, very small YouTube channel. I want to do about 3000 miles in your car over about three weeks, taking it all sorts of places. And um, I'm really quite easy. I'll take anything. If you've got something, if you're actually going to give me a car, I'll do the trip in a picanto. I really, really don't mind, obviously. Obviously, I'd love a stinger, but also I'm, uh, I'm realistic. I, I know that's not gonna happen. So I said, okay, we'll, we'll see what we can do. For two weeks, I heard nothing. I started trying to work out how I was gonna save enough money to get a hire car from Hertz or somewhere, and that was gonna be at least a thousand pounds, which to give you some context, at that time represented probably about six or seven months of my YouTube revenue. Then, two weeks later, an email came through from a different lady saying, can we have your driving license number, your passport, flight details, and everything? And I said, uh, well, does, does, um, does this mean you're, you're giving me a car? And she said, yeah. Oh, oh okay. Um, what are you giving me? And she said, it's a Stinger GT2, top of the line. I, I was blown away. I, I absolutely blown away. I was going to America to do a three week road trip. And this is one of the first times I've been to the States in about 15 years. To basically sofa surf, three weeks of adventure, being kindly hosted by the most amazing of people that don't know me at all, they've just seen me on the internet. And to do all of this traveling, I was gonna be given a brand spanking new, top of the line Kia Stinger GT2, which is the top model variant over there. I landed in New Jersey, not even New York, with the most basic of instructions that told me, here's where you go, tell these people you're after a Kia Stinger, it's in a sort of purple parking type thing, you know, airport parking type thing. Went there, asked for the key to this car that I guessed was the one I was getting. They handed it over. I got in this thing and I started driving. I saw the New York skyline for the first time in, in a long time. And it's quite an iconic skyline. And I was sat there in traffic, in heavy, awful, terrible New York traffic, uh, just, just this side of the George Washington Bridge, I think. And uh, I cried because I was so unbelievably happy and so grateful that all of these people from all over the world had all come together to do the nicest of things for me, who even to this day, I feel like I give so little back for the things that I've been given, but it was just the most wonderful trip. I went to all these different places. I drove the tail of the dragon in a Kia Stinger. I went to Buffalo in a Kia Stinger. I went to Gettysburg in a Kia Stinger. 
I did about 11 states in one go. I did the most miles I've ever done solo in one day in a Stinger, 730 miles. I did Buffalo to Nashville, Tennessee in one hit and the Stinger made it easy. I found old family out there that I didn't realize I had. I went to a graveyard where a relative is buried that I, I didn't realize that I, that I had out there. And I, I took the Stinger there. Drove around a graveyard. It was a big graveyard. I wasn't being reckless. And um, so that was an incredible moment where I just sat there and thought, you know what? Cool, you've made the right decision. I was still earning no money off YouTube, of course, but it was now giving me the experiences that, um, that I just didn't think I'd ever have. And at that point, I decided I'm not looking back. I'm not going back to my old life. I'm not going back to film. YouTube, come hell or high water, I'm gonna make it work. And if you're watching, it has worked. And uh, thank you for being a part of that journey, no matter how late or early you've joined me on it, it, it doesn't matter, you're here. That's the only thing that's important. I'm getting soppy, aren't I? Let's move on. It was during this trip that I really began to realize also how special the Stinger was and what it had done for the Kia brand. Because everywhere I went, generally, I was talking to car people, Lotus people, Porsche people, BMW people. I even bumped into a member of Audi's US PR team. And every time I spoke to anyone and they said, oh, what are you driving? And I said, a Kia Stinger. They were interested, they were excited, they wanted to see it, they wanted to go out in it. And I highly doubt that anybody bought a Stinger off the back of me showing it to them. But they were all very impressed and they all went, hmm, I never really thought Kia made anything like that. That's quite good. The Americans didn't even mind the fuel economy that it was doing, which in American was about 23 to the gallon. And that's equivalent to I think about 27 or so here. This week I've had the car, I've been averaging about 29 or so. It's not great, but Americans don't really mind. They probably also like the fact that at the rear, it does look a little bit like a Dodge Charger. Well, the lights do anyway, to my eyes. But I thought, hmm, this car's doing a lot right, isn't it? And that car really was the perfect companion for that trip. When I first drove this on that experience day, Kia handed over a piece of paper in which they said, this is a GT in the old fashioned sense of the word, a Grand Tourer, a car designed to cover large distances. It is not a track car. And that stuck with me for a couple of reasons. First off, it amused me that Kia's own press material for this in the USA featured an old Formula One driver Mario Andretti, I think, drifting the car around a track. And also, Top Gear had featured this car and declared it rubbish because it wasn't any good on a track, as Top Gear often does. And they just totally missed the point. Is it a perfect car? No. The ride is a little bit indecisive at times, can be a touch choppier than you want it to be on difficult tarmac. Like I said before, it hasn't got quite as much grip as it really should have in the USA. You could actually get these with all-wheel drive, but not here. However, there are more than a few reasons why I don't feel it's at all inappropriate to call this a Korean Maserati. As a point of reference, I previously owned a fifth generation Maserati Quattroporte Sport GTS and only a couple of days ago, whilst I've had this on loan, I drive a 2018 Maserati Ghibli Grand Sport with the 3 litre V6. So a very, very close comparison for this car. The major difference being that were you to try and buy the equivalent Ghibli today, the V6 with, OK, a little bit more power than this now, it would set you back £95,000. And truth be told, were I to try and explain to you where that extra money went, I would fail. The Maserati is certainly the better looking car. This is a handsome thing, makes quite a statement. I kind of like its Coupaloon styling, even though I'm not a big fan of the genre. But in terms of panel, fit and finish, the Kia is easily a match for the Maserati. And I'm sure there are people out there that feel that's quite a low bar. But inside, this also does really rather well too. OK, maybe the Maserati's got a little bit nicer stitching and a few more bits of carbon fibre. But actually, this feels more bespoke. There are more elements from what I deem to be cheaper cars in the Maserati. You shouldn't have switches from a 20 grand car in a 90 grand one. Even the car that I drove when new would have cost over £70,000. And the fact is, it just, just doesn't quite work. 
the infotainment of the Kia is vastly superior and that when you're covering big distances really does make a difference. Unfortunately the interior room is a little bit compromised by comparison, headroom in particular. If you're over six foot the Stinger may not be the car for you but both have comfortable leather seats. This actually has a few more functions and the way they drive is also similar too. Both have a very punchy three litre turbocharged V6 engine. But even more than that, when you begin to press on, this has a similar level of suppleness to the Maserati. Perhaps a, a little less refined at low speeds, and I do mean a little, but it's got that darty steering, a really quick turn in. It's a very, very exciting car to drive this. And every time I get back in one, I'm reminded of just how good the damn thing is. It's brilliant this. Take this bend for example, foot down, loads of grunt, loads of go. <laughs> this moves this thing. Downshift, downshift. That gearbox responds so quickly. You've got to be careful through here. It's still a bit chilly on the road. Whoa. You come to that next bend quick. The electric steering in this maybe doesn't have quite the same feel as the Maserati. You can feel the front end pushing it a little bit wide, a little bit sooner, but then you're back on the power and the car fires you down the road. It's interactive, it's exciting. It works with the tarmac. It's not a totally inert thing. It does speak to you, this car. And sure, the limits are a bit lower than maybe they should be, but also it's hilarious, this thing. You see that Kia badge and you just go, yeah, okay, sure, little front wheel drive, boring thing with no power, no go. <laughs> it's not, it's rear wheel drive, it's got loads of go. It's mega, this thing. And the only test that really to many I think matters, the smile on the face, <laughs> the Stinger, pass with flying colors. Over the years, the Stinger did evolve. It got facelifted. The tiger nose, as Kia call it at the front, got a little bit wider. The wheels changed in style too, though I'm not sure I'm that fond of these. The colour of this particular example I'm also in love with. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to look it up and put it on the screen. Bing! And um, in the flesh, you first look at it and think it's grey, but there's a lot of green to it. I actually really, really like this. If you told me it was like a historic Ferrari colour or something, I would believe you. The basic equipment list for the Stinger was always high and that didn't really change, but the infotainment got a larger screen, there were some subtle improvements to various different elements, but the major difference was, as the car went on here in the UK, they realised that people weren't at all interested in the four-cylinder engines, the petrol 2.0-litre and the diesel 2.2. So for its last few years, the Stinger was available exclusively as you see it here with the 3.3 litre, 370 horsepower turbo V6 and in GT trim, which gets you all the toys. In fact, one of the things I've always liked about Kia is they don't really do options. You pick your car, you pick your engine, pick your trim, and then generally speaking, the only thing to actually choose are dealer fit accessories like floor mats and the like, and your paint. That's it. I remember vividly one evening in Pennsylvania. I'd gone out to meet a bunch of Lotus people and had a fairly good time. Then on the way home, in the dark, it began to rain quite heavily. As I was proceeding through this torrential downpour, a light was coming the other way and it looked like the front of a car, so I slowed down even further. I couldn't really see what was going on. It seemed to be a singular light too, so I thought perhaps some poor sod is out here on a motorbike. And as I got closer, horses came past, drawing a carriage. I was in the middle of Amish country. And for a Brit, I know even for some Americans, the Amish are this odd thing that you only see on television. And to be driving through the middle of the night and to see two Amish in a horse-drawn carriage going past the other way, that was nothing short of surreal. As it happens, the Stinger isn't really a great fit for the Tale of the Dragon, but the fact is, just about no car short of a Lotus Elise is. In case you weren't familiar, the Tale of the Dragon is an amazing road that kind of borders Tennessee and I believe Carolina, and it's something like 315 curves in about 11 miles, nearly all of them tight technical switchback things. The speed limit officially is 35 mile an hour, though roundly ignored, but frankly, even 35 mile an hour through some sections is really quite difficult. And um, the Stinger did a very, very good job, I have to say, but uh, it's not a road I think I'm going to go out of my way to experience. I will not, however, say the same for Watkins Glen, which turned out to be one of the best motoring experiences of my entire life. 
and I am incredibly grateful to John for bringing me out there and to Kyla too for introducing me to New York Safety Track, which I really would never ever have gone to, I think, had he not invited me, but was also brilliant. And if you find yourself in the New York area and wanting to do a track day, I do believe they're still in business and still doing events. So um, check them out. I'll put a link in the description down below. Another bizarre but very fond memory I have is that when I stayed at Watkins Glen, it was in a very unusual motel type thing. And in the room, there was an old fashioned TV and a VHS player. And in reception, they had a big box of VHSs. Remember, this is 2018. This was already a very, very old tech. But I had time. I was in a fantastic mood, still slightly jet lagged, so sleeping odd hours. And of the two evenings that I was there, I watched The English Patient and Legally Blonde on a VHS outside of Watkins Glen in a motel. That stuff stays with you. <laughs> I appreciate that the vast majority of people that would have considered a car like this almost certainly went and bought, say, a BMW 440i or perhaps even the Jaguar equivalent. But there's still something magical about this. One day, I think I will have to buy one, else I will forever be a hypocrite for telling everyone else how great the car is and then um, ignoring it and buying something else. I know that's what I did when I got the Maserati, but I am a petrol head at heart. And um, also, when the car market went a little bit strange, these suddenly did start selling as I think people couldn't get the car that they wanted. And so there are three stingers now in my town, which is pretty amazing. And I am the sort of person that always likes to have something different. So um, that's why I haven't bought one, or more accurately, why I didn't buy one. Of course, the Stinger is not perfect. There are plenty of reasons why people wouldn't buy one. I think many felt they were just too expensive for a Kia, regardless of how good they were. They also do, as I may have mentioned, like a drink, and the service intervals are pretty short too. Kia are very well known for their seven year warranty, which I think is a fantastic thing and certainly part of their rise. However, to maintain that, the V6 Stinger requires servicing every 6,000 miles. And that, I think, was a mistake. In America, they don't really care about that sort of stuff. They like short service intervals. They love doing 3,000 mile oil changes. But here, we've begun getting used to people saying, oh, only 20,000 miles for a service. And so I think that, certainly for your potential fleet buyers, along with the fuel economy, would have scuppered the stinger in the eyes of many. The CO2 figures of the engine also put this car out of contention for many in certain markets. So when I last did a video of this, some people from Scandinavia told me that while here maybe it's £10,000 or so cheaper than the equivalent BMW, there it's ten pounds to £20,000 more expensive just because of the emissions. Though officially the Stinger has no direct replacement, spiritually its place has been taken in the Kia lineup by the new all-electric EV6 GT. And I was there for the launch of the EV6 GT, very grateful to Kia for once again bringing me out on an incredible press event, particularly as they flew me to Sweden on the day that the UK recorded its hottest ever temperatures. So um, it was a nice escape from some searing sun here in Britain. The EV6 GT is a fantastic car and one that I hope to be able to feature in more depth soon. But even from the brief drive that I had, joined by fellow YouTuber Petrol Ped, hello Ped if you're watching, and uh, thanks for helping with the footage, it was a really, really exciting thing. And a car that I think also owes a lot to this. You see, I firmly believe that without the Stinger, the EV6 GT is a car that we might not have got, or certainly might not have got now. But because the Stinger proved that not only did Kia have the mechanical and technical knowledge to build something that's high performance and good at it, but also the company had an appetite for doing this kind of stuff. And though this didn't sell in massive quantities, I'm sure not as much as they would have liked, it did sell. And most importantly, the likes of myself, somewhat cynical automotive journalists, saw cars like this and went, hmm, this is actually quite good. So by the time the EV6 GT came out, it wasn't really all that much of a surprise because we all knew Kia had it in them.
And though it's possible, had I not sent that email to Kia five years ago, my life would have turned out broadly the same. I also do believe that it would have been a little bit lesser for it. If for no other reason, then I would have missed out on the experience of so many amazing cars. Not just the Stinger, but much of the rest of the Kia lineup, the Picanto, the Seed. Another great memory I have is I was one of the first people in the entire world, along with my co-conspirator Laurie, to do a road trip in the then new Seed GT, which I suppose many people didn't feel all that remarkable, and that's why nobody watched the video. But it was an amazing experience. We went out to Spain together and everyone else had this preset itinerary, but we said to Kia, you know what, we're trying to film and it's quite difficult to film and follow this. So they said, um, all right, well, when we land, you pick a car, you go off and do your own thing. And talking about the car, this is still a brilliant thing. As hopefully you've seen today, it's packed with features, is an excellent drive, a really surprisingly good steer, and still very good value for money. The prices have risen a little bit in the last year, as they have for just about everything else, but in the case of the Stinger, I think rightly so. A nearly new one of these, or pre-registered if you can find it, is about £40,000, and for that it offers incredible value for money. The likes of which I suspect we may not be seeing from Kia anytime soon, because though they still offer a lot for the cash, they're also a brand that is moving up market. To give you some context, a top-of-the-line Sportage will now set you back the same as this. So um, if you are a petrol head on the hunt for a slightly different daily driver that's still exciting and makes people go, hmm, don't forget the Stinger, because I never will. I want to say a big thanks to all of you for putting up with that soppy, soppy, whimsical, lyrical nonsense. I do hope that you've enjoyed it. And most importantly, a big thank you to Kia for being absolute stars, not just UK, but worldwide. And as ever, if you've enjoyed today's video, hit the like button, comment down below and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.